Hello and welcome to this webinar of the Wind in Our Sales series, Being Well to Lead Well. My name is Carl King and I am the Associate Director of Development at Duke Divinity School. I'm sitting in for Michael Brickhouse, our Director of Alumni Relations, who is on his paternity leave. You'll be glad to know that his son and uh, older daughter are doing very well, as is his wife, Kristen. Uh, Michael is transitioning within the Divinity School into a role at LEAD, our partner organization. Uh, he will not be alumni director in uh, just the next few weeks, but we'll be announcing a new director very soon. And we look forward to sharing that news with you. Before the session, all our presenters are present and they are introduced in the video. So I'll let the video introduce them, uh, but I'd like to open us with a word of prayer first. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, new every morning is your love. All day long you are working for good in the world. Let us pray. New every morning is your love, great God of light. We give you thanks for all that you do in our lives. Those of us called to ministry can find ministry to be so depleting, so challenging. As rewarding as serving you is, Lord, we are called upon in so many ways that we, being human, can be brought low. In this time, Lord, we ask your blessing that the conversation and thoughts might indeed be encouragements, that your people may be comforted, consoled, and strengthened to serve you in the ways in which we know they're able to fulfill the gifts you've given them in full. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. During the video that will play in just a moment, I want to ask you, if you would, to please submit your questions in the q and I'll pull from those while uh, after the video when we have a question and answer session with our presenters. We'll watch the video now. Hello, I am LaTanya Agard, and I'm glad to welcome you today to the next series of conversations in the Wind in Our Sail Seminar. We're grateful today for Duke Divinity School, for our alumni community, and the uh, various voices that we're going to share today. Our topic for our seminar today is being well to lead well. Leadership resilience in troubled times. It's no doubt that churches and individuals, families and clergy have experienced great distress during the pandemic, before the pandemic, and we know it will be sure that troubled times will come after the pandemic. Our hope today is that we can review narratives of faith, of connection, of hope, and that these narratives will challenge and nurture clergy to return to those same stories in their lives so that they can bounce back, so that we can move forward or maybe even stand still and endure our difficult times. Today, you're going to hear from the voices of incredible women who are leading in various ways. You'll hear from Dr. Anathea Portier-Young, who is on staff at Duke Divinity School. You're here from the Reverend Melissa Flora Bixler, who's serving as the pastor of the Raleigh Mennonite Church. You'll also hear from Dr. Monique Antoinette Williams, who is the founder and leader of the nonprofit, the Heirloom Foundation, which is located in Houston, Texas. You'll also hear from me. I lead the Transformation Fellowship Christian Church located in Apex, North Carolina. I'm also a spiritual counselor or spiritual mentor here at the Duke Divinity School for the DMIN students in our current cohort. Again, our desire today is to offer up our stories and perspectives, and maybe somewhere within our story, you'll also hear your story and you'll be inspired to be still, to stand strong, to bounce back as a leader 
who is determined to be well so that you can lead well. When God began to create, the world was a mess. When God began to speak order and light and life into the chaos, God's spirit had to take some time just to get the measure of it all, just to hover for a while over the deep. And then God got to work, but not the grind. God didn't go to committee meetings, not that first week anyway. The answer to the yawning void was creativity. The poetry of God, first rapper, singer, songwriter, metalsmith, landscape architect, sculptor, clothing designer, and dressmaker. The rhythms of God's spoken word and sculpted earth became the rhythms of our cosmos, day and night, song and silence, vibrant color and inky darkness, soulful dancing, and the stillness of sleep and death. We sit with the brokenhearted and walk with the penitent. We preach our guts out. We counsel and plan and budget and teach. But when you look out over the mess, remember that you are in the image of the Creator. So first, take a beat. We already have the hover covered. We have taken the measure of the mess, but to get truly creative, we also have to step back from the clutter in our schedules. We need empty space to breathe in the wind. Breathe in God's mischief-making spirit. And then I invite you to get down to God's work, but not the work that's in your job description. Create something for its own sake. Tap your feet, move your body, beat drums and shake tambourines, paint dreamscapes and stitch portraits, write poetry, sing a song, pluck strings and put on street theater, design shoes and spray graffiti. Build an ark to hold your covenant with your maker. Maybe you claim some artistic talent and maybe you don't. It doesn't matter. Creativity is celebration of God's infinite capacity. It is openness. It is our commitment to the possibility of newness and transformation. In our creativity, we participate in the work of the God who makes a way out of no way, who makes light in darkness and life in a landscape of death and decay. There's one more step. After you create, after you sing, dance, write, stitch, paint, plant, stop. We imitate God in our creativity. We also imitate God in our stopping. God created for six days and then God just stopped. God let this world God made do its thing all the things it was made to do. Oh, but God, the world is so different now. What with telecommuting and smartphones and time zones, we've got deadlines and sermons to write and this crisis just won't wait. It will wait 
Don't mistake being in God's image for being God. God chose a day to let the world do its thing. And when we follow God's example, we learn that for all our doing and creativity and problem solving, our survival, our blessing, our prosperity, our holiness is not our doing, it is God's. My friends, you are made in the image of God, the creator, God, the poet and dancer. When God rested, God was refreshed. Go, create, stop, rest, and be refreshed. Good day, all. My name is Dr. Monique Williams, and I am the founder and visionary of the Heirloom Foundation in Houston, Texas. I also graduated from Duke Divinity School in 2008. And today it is a pleasure of mine to just share my musings with you on the topic of leadership and resilience in view of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Christ arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. God maketh me to lie down in green pastures. God leadeth me beside the still waters. God restoreth my soul. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. God saw all that God had made and saw that it was very good. Why do we seek God in the earth when we are travailed? Why do we trek mountains to feel a sense of accomplishment? Why do we spread our arms wide and photosynthesize in the sun when we are grateful? Why are we drawn to bodies of water to ponder and contemplate? Why must we be like a tree planted by the water or have wings like eagles that we may soar? The scriptures are riddled with comparative language that demonstrates the intimacy that God intended between humanity and the earth. The earth is the embodiment of what it means to operate at the peak of our purpose. When we are functioning exactly as the manufacturer intended, when we are our best selves. Mountains represent challenges turned victories. Valleys depict fear turned courage. Rain is hope for dry places. The sky above illustrates limitlessness and freedom. And the ground below demonstrates certainty and sure-footedness. We are a part of God's creation. In fact, I submit that we have woefully missed the mark in our understanding of or misunderstanding of the gift of domination given to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1. And I take issue with the fact that God would have us subjugate vanish, defeat, crush, quell the physical manifestation of God's words, God's creative imagination, and God's love in the form of the earth. We are not supervisors, foremen or women, master or slave holder. At best, we are stewards of the earth, and at most, we are homoousios, of the same substance. Isn't it in Genesis where it says God formed humanity of the dust of the ground? The dust preceded us and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life and humanity became a living soul. When we think about what it means to be made of the earth and mimic the characteristics of the earth, I feel like we only see it in the form of productivity. We are obsessed with the idea that we must create and manufacture and construct Plant the seed of knowledge and grow a career. Plant the seed of love and harvest a family. Plant the seed of financial savvy and produce financial security. Plant the seed of effort and harvest success. But what of the season when we don't plant? When we don't dig, 
or weed or prune or pick, what do we produce then? Nothing. We produce nothing. We rest. Let the land be renewed and lie uncultivated during the seventh year. Let it lie unplowed and unused. Let it lie still. Your rest allows the living things among you to be refreshed. In other words, your rest leads others to rest. As women, we are seen for our utility and celebrated by our level of busyness, thus neglecting one of our most inherent needs. Not breath, not sun, not food, but rest. And on the seventh day, God finished the work and rested. So this is less of a lecture and more of an invitation to consider that God saw fit to demonstrate rest the same way that God demonstrates patience and love. We understand resilience to be the capacity to recover quickly in light of our, um, in light of or despite difficulties. But I wonder if we followed the example of God in creation and let others do the same, would we be studying, celebrating, obsessing, awarding trophies for resilience? Or would we simply be living our best lives? Thank you. My family was broken, literally broken. My daughter's elbow hosted a radial head fracture. My spouse hobbled around on a bionic looking leg brace that supported his torn ACL. My son proudly held out a pen to all passersby who might be willing to sign his arm cast. Eventually, my youngest child asked for a wrist brace of her own. She felt left out. These were weeks of chaos in our household. But the first Sunday after these myriad of injuries pounced on our family, we dutifully hobbled and wobbled and dragged our bodies into church for worship. We didn't have much of a choice. After all, I am the pastor. If you're like me, I spend most of my pastoral attention on attending to and caring for and organizing care for the people of our congregation. I check on Mark, who's had a difficult time staying on the wagon during the extreme isolation as a single person working from home. I call Judy to make sure she's getting enough visits to feel sustained and whole. Two babies are born in the same month, and we are a flurry of meals and diaper deliveries. Our church is a community, a community that actively and materially cares for one another. I'm grateful for this church who employs me to pay attention to our precious and vulnerable lives in their many different seasons. But I spend less time thinking of myself and my body and my family as part of this community. It's easy for me to spend so much time looking outwards that I realize I haven't looked around. And once I look around, I discover me. On that first Sunday in worship as a multiple injury family, I remembered something. I am also part of this community. For the next two weeks, various Mennonite grandmothers appeared at our doorstep to deliver green bean casserole and pre-baked lasagna. A wide array of leg braces and slings were offered up. People offered to pick up our children from school, and they sent us funny stories and wise anecdotes about their own injuries. It was impossible to ignore the breaks and tears we brought into church. But I was reminded of how many other injuries, the ones that are hidden, that I don't bring to my congregation. Somewhere along the way, in the hope of honoring the boundaries of pastoral disclosure, of centering my attention on my church, I'd lost track of the fact that they are my community too. What would it have been like to share with them how painful and paralyzing the decisions around health and safety of our congregation had been for me these past two years? How would it have changed our relationships to offer the vulnerability of my own inadequacy for the massive task of shifting church into a new post-pandemic era? What new kinds of community might have been birthed? 
Community is a place of vulnerability and holiness. Cultivating community requires trust, and sometimes that trust is betrayed. In unhealthy churches, we might find that our vulnerability and brokenness are held out to us as a sign of weakness or our inability to lead. We enter cautiously, testing to see how much of our self is welcome here. But every once in a while, we are surprised to discover that community was there all along, patiently waiting for the time when we couldn't hide our needs when the people we've been attending to become the people who are community to us. When was the first time you thought about giving up? Were you a kid on a, a baseball field and you missed, you missed catching the, the hit that was a home run for the other team? Maybe you thought about giving up when you didn't get the grade you wanted on your AP chemistry exam. Maybe it was later in life. Something happened, maybe it was cancer, maybe, maybe your husband or your wife decided he or she didn't want to be with you anymore. Maybe you wanted to give up when you couldn't find the partner that you really, really wanted to spend the rest of your life with and you thought, you know what, I'll just throw in the towel I look back at my own life and I can see so many moments when I wanted to give up. I wanted to throw in the towel. I wanted to sit on the sidelines and, and just give in to the feelings of despair and depression and anxiety that were overwhelming at the time. The sense of isolation and, and defeat that I believe visit all of us are very familiar to me. When I think of my life as a clergy person, as a pastor, as a ministry leader, I can name so many moments that have been difficult for me. Moments when I did not see eye to eye with the church leadership who were leading alongside me, but saw ministry and mission in a way that seemed very foreign to me. I remember once being around a table with people I loved and respected, but I felt incredibly disconnected from them because their vision of church life and ministry was in such discord and dissonance with mine. And I thought to myself, maybe it's time to simply give up. Maybe it's time to move forward. Maybe it's time for me to find something else altogether to do with my life. That wasn't the first time, and it would not be the last. My point is simply that as people and as leaders, we face difficulties every day. For some of us, those difficulties come to us in the form of physical sickness. They come to us in, in the form of mental and emotional breakdowns. They come as eviction letters and floor closure letters. They, they come in so many ways. And yet here we are today. For me, getting here was, was not easy. I got here through my own connection to Christ. That sounds so simple. It sounds so trite. It sounds overly simplified, but it's the truth. As I think about what it means to be well so that I can lead well, I return constantly to my own relationship, to the living Christ, the Son of God, the one who has come to set me free. Set me free from my sense of defeat. Set me free from those moments where I felt that I did not have what it takes to lead a congregation, to be a good wife, to be a good mother or grandmother, to take the next step in my own spiritual journey. So I want to think about you, or I want you to think about yourself in this moment. At the end of this seminar, as we begin to move into our time of questions and answers, what is it? What is it that has grounded you 
during your most difficult times. The connection to Christ, your faith in God, your connection to community, or perhaps your understanding of God as creator and the beautiful creation where he has planted us. However you find resilience, wherever you find your strength, may God continue to bless you and to give you what you need for the journey, even through difficult times. I wanna thank each of our presenters for their recorded presentations there. And I wanna invite our participants to begin to ask questions in the question and answer box. Um, there's a button at the bottom of your screen, Q&A, and you can submit those there. Um, as the presenters turn their cameras on and, and join us, I wanted to um, begin with uh, Dr. Agard, if I could. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, and I'll glean more from the, the uh, question and answer as time goes on, but um, your invitation to us to find where we're grounded um, was quite comforting. I wonder if you could speak to um, that moment of being slow that, that you talked about for a lot of people, when they finally come to that, that broken point, um, they can't always see how they're going to turn around and become resilient, get up and do this again. Um, I wanted to ask, is the point of sort of confessing our brokenness, is that one of the steps in becoming resilient? And, and if it is, how so? Uh, thanks, Carl, for that question. I, I think you're right. Um, Admitting our brokenness and the, the limitations of our strength um, is really about admitting that we're human, admitting that we don't have the answers, that we've reached the end of our understanding. And once we're able to fully embrace our humanity, I think for me in those moments, because there's certainly been more than one, <laughs> in those moments, I can rehearse the other times that, that God and community and friends have spoken into my life, have uh, put more wind in my sails. And because God's done it in the past and I've seen God work in so many amazing ways, I am encouraged to get up and to try again. And I think the biggest thing is to know that, you know, defeat is not about getting knocked down or being brought low. We see that throughout the scriptures. Uh, defeat happens when we don't experience the resurrection, when we lose the ability to hope that in this moment right now, God can still work and God can still do a new thing. So I want to encourage pastors, leaders out there who are facing a sense of internal defeat, even though everything on the outside may look great, but inside we are hurting and broken and tired that maybe as we begin to share in spaces together, develop communities of trust, that we can learn to rehearse God's goodness and together we can figure out a way to move forward. Amen. Yeah, together we can figure out a way to move forward. Um, you know, in the question and answer, uh, Bethany it recounts a story of being open with her committee about uh, her and her family's vulnerability and that that worked out and that she and, and the congregation sort of came more together. In fact, it sounds like, as she says, her church has supported her with meals three times a week. Um, that's really reciprocal and not the pastor only giving. Um, makes me think of uh, Reverend Flora Bixler's uh, presentation. I felt like we could all definitely relate to the image of, um, at least metaphorically, to the whole family being broken in one way or another. Um, every pastor's family, I think, certainly feels that way. Uh, I've got a, a practical question for you, Reverend Flora Bixler, and I invite others to chime in as well. But um, in being vulnerable to your uh, lay leaders, to your congregation, um, I imagine that there are certain places where that's more appropriate than others. Um, and maybe appropriate is not the right word. Um, it might be mo more helpful than others to say, share something in a committee versus sharing from the pulpit 
or um, could you speak to uh, it, it's it's a little it's a hard question. Can you speak to say different layers of vulnerability and what's appropriate where in when you're leading a congregation? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because I think you know we recognize um, that pastoral disclosure is also a place of power, um, and so. Uh, how do we recognize that um, what we share um, opens up spaces for um, shifting power in our congregational life? Um, and and yeah, so I, I do think that there there is a strategicness about what and how we share um, um, what's happening in our lives. Um, and it may actually happen in places um, that are not your traditional maybe um, a pastoral relations committee, it may actually be an advocate or someone who has consistently showed up for you in congregational life. Um, someone who needs to, someone else in your congregation who doesn't necessarily have one of those roles. Um, I should also say, um, Latanya and I are in a, a clergy women's group together. And um, I just want to lift up that that has been one of the most life-giving uh, resources available to me um, over the past couple years um, because it does allow us to a more unfiltered space for our sharing um, of our lives among people who really know what it's like because we're all clergy women together. So um, definitely encourage people if you're not in um, uh, available, if you're not in a pastoral clergy group yet, um, that is an also an incredible source of community. No doubt, yeah, um, that, that's a good invitation. I, I, I think that pastors don't always give themselves permission or or maybe aren't always in communities where there are other pastors who they feel they can really connect to. Um, maybe the this Zoom culture we're in now, um, while we'd all love to be in person, um, maybe technology can link us together in, in more ways than we would, than we would think. Um, <clears throat> There's a, another question um, from uh, St. Timothy's UMC uh, directed to you, Reverend Flora Bixler, that's uh, on an article about capitalism killing the small church, um, pressures to perform and overwork in the small church setting. Can you reflect on navigating the capitalist culture and expectations of a pastor and how to be resilient in the face of those rather than than overworking. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is also one of those places that we need to resist is that um, pastors are not um, being paid a fee for services. And if we have developed a culture of church that treats the pastor primarily as another employee to fulfill um, a gap in programming or um, therapy, we have people to pay to do those things in our lives. Our primary role is to be witnesses to um, the resurrected Jesus Christ in the common life of the body of which pastors are a part. Um, and so I think that's something that we need to be aware of in our context. Um, but if, if um, the other thing I say in that article is um, we also have to help our um, our congregations and um, con our congregants know how to organize to to not have the kind of work life that um, overwhelms them with busyness, um, where they're work martyrs. Um, mm -hmm. And so I hope that um, churches begin to, and especially in light of the great resignation, to be a part of labor movements in more um, robust ways. Yeah, well said. I, I remember someone um, saying that they've stopped talking about work life balance and have started talking about life work balance to prioritize the the life um and your answer reminds me and makes me think of um reverend or dr williams presentation um and i qu a practical question for you dr williams but it's it's right along the same lines because so reverend flora bixler was just talking about the temptation for pastors to be sucked into that productivity mindset. And you spoke very, very movingly against that and kind of claiming um, what I found really helpful, the, the invitation for us to reorient ourselves in creation 
and, and homoousios, you know, that we are we are dirt, you know, we are with one substance with God's gift of creation. Um, how do we rest in a way that invites others to rest? Like, can can you speak to say practical um, practices that? that kind of put, put that rest on display in, in a way? A wonderful question. Thank you so much. Um, so I believe that we have to kind of get away from um, looking at rest as something so different and so alien and so separate from the things that are um, necessities to us, right? So if I want my family to eat well, not only will I prepare a meal, but I'll demonstrate what eating well looks like. I will make that look like something that is absolutely like what I needed all of my life, right? I make it appetizing. Um, I take time with it. I present it. I embody this experience. Um, and so eventually they don't just do as I say, but they do as I do because wow, she's eating well and she's taking care of herself and, and she is um, controlling you know, weight and she's controlling her, um, her blood levels and all this other stuff. So I've exemplified this and they want to do the same. So I feel like it's just the same as that. We look at rest in the same way, not something that is, you know, earned, but something that we absolutely do. And then they see what rest does for us. And they want some of that too. Um, now, if we're waiting until we absolutely crash, then we just look sick, right? <laughs> if we just like, if, that's not necessarily what we talk about, you know, when we're talking about rest, crashing is like we're, we're in trouble, right? But when we exemplify rest, when we, what is in our calendar, as it is a lunch meal, you know, a lunch date, um, as it is a meeting that we might have, something that's a priority that we cannot forget because if we do, there is consequence, then maybe we will begin to do this more naturally. Um, I, I could, I'd love to say, hey, just, you know, just feel it, just make it happen. But right now in the time that we're in, when we're required to put everything down and make a schedule for everything, do that with rest until it's something that we just do. Um, but I think it really is about exemplifying and embodying and making it a priority and then helping people see the, tran the transformation that um, including rest in our lives has done for us. People respond to transformation. Um, so that practically, honestly, writing it down, making this something that we do um, as part of our schedule, like eating and sleeping and accomplishing tasks until one day we just do it the same way that we pick up a meal on the way home, um, the same way that we will not forget that important meeting every Tuesday at 530 until it becomes something that is a part of our rhythm. Your uh, your answer is convicting me to maybe return to the practice of of uh, an automatic reply on my email that I'm not available. Um, we too few of us, I think, uh, can do that sometimes. But seeing the transformation that's uh, that's helpful helpful reminder for us to to witness to what changed habits ourselves have produced or have, have resulted in for us. Um, I want to invite our our, um, our participants on the webinar to uh, submit their questions in the Q and A. Um, one that's come through right now is it gets at a, a deep issue. And those of you who serve congregations, um, I wonder if you can answer this. Um, do you think it's correct for pastors who are separating from their spouses or getting divorced uh, to be so public about it on social media? Um, and let me get to the earlier questions of Reverend, Reverend Floor Bixler about um, what's appropriate in what setting. Um, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, are, are dealing with that, experiencing that. Um, there may be two different ways to look at it. What, what would uh, what would you say, say, uh, Dr. Agard? I'll I'll call you out first. <laughs> 
<laughs> I I saw that that question in the Q and A, and and I'll be honest, my first my quest first question was, wow, I wonder where that question comes from. Um, like what what place? It sounds like a place of of a place of really being torn. Uh, what does this mean? And is this healthy? Um, I'll just say that as pastors, as um, uh, Pastor Flora Bixler has said, we, you know, we have to be very careful about what we share and when we share. And just as Dr. Williams just mentioned about modeling, and I think in our culture that's so saturated with this sort of social media um, sort of persona, and the, the instant gratification we get from posting something, whether good or bad, and getting this immediate feedback. Um, I think that can become toxic. And with so many lives being impacted by, you know, what we post and why we post it, um, it's hard for me to say in every instance whether it's good or bad to post on social media. But I do think the real question is what is the motivation? behind wanting to post or feeling the need to post and what kind of response, where is that coming from? And if it's coming from a place of manipulation, if it's coming from a place of attention seeking, if it's coming from a place of trying to heal inner wounds related to that, I think the healthier place to do it is in a safe sanctuary, like a therapeutic relationship in counseling or therapy or with the spiritual director or someone else whom you trust, uh, because those are not healthy places uh, or healthy ways to engage the world. And so that's how I would approach that question. Um, it would be interesting to hear what other pastors think, but uh, yeah, that's, that's where I would go with it. Any, any others want to chime in on that? It's a it's a big topic, and uh, and um, well, as with so many uh, topics that we deal with, uh, fraught with a lot of emotion uh, on on both sides. Um, so, Dr. Portia Young, uh, your presentation really just made scripture come alive for me. Um, when you talked about you know God hovering over the mess and being and and I, I love this you know being rapper and metalsmith and dressmaker um, all those things are true and I just had never thought of it that way uh, I wonder if you could speak to um, pastors right who we we turn to scripture over and over again in order to provide something for other people. Um, when we are really in need, where have you found um, scripture to be life-giving um, when you're looking for uh, comfort and consolation? Where, where can these leaders who need to be resilient for others find, um, find support for themselves? Um, thank you, Carl, for that question and, and for the, that feedback. Uh, you know, I think the Psalter is my go-to for um, helping us to be honest with ourselves in the process of being honest with God and, and you know, just putting those hand in hand. And sometimes we, we don't wanna say <laughs> the, all, the, all the feelings that uh, maybe we're, maybe we feel a little ashamed of our humanness, of our, whether it's we're sad, uh, we feel uh, not up to the challenges. We just, you know, we're we're hovering over the mess and feeling kind of overwhelmed, and we don't want to say it. And and as as Reverend Agard was just saying, like maybe we don't need to say it uh, on social media or you know in the pulpit uh, when it's about us specifically, right? But we still need to um, express it to God, and and that honesty. Man, it's it's all over the Psalter, right? You <laughs> you can't get away from it. Um, the the number one most frequent type of psalm, of course, we've got praise and we've got uh, thanksgiving, but number one is lament. And uh, and whatever your situation is, there's a psalm for that, right? Uh, and and you know, one of the psalms that is most important to me is Psalm 88, because uh, anyone who's, of course, gone through seminary and they've studied the forms of the Psalms, right? They know that that almost every lament Psalm is going to move through. Here's my problem. Here's how I feel about it. 
Um, but here's the kind of thing God does, and I'm so hopeful, and I know God's going to fix it. But Psalm 88 doesn't make that that last set of moves, right? It just it just stops in this feeling of I I feel bereft. Uh, I don't know where my friends are right now. It's dark, and you know, hello. <laughs> just we just pause there and the very next psalm is like i'm going to sing of god's steadfast love and and we're we're confident again right so so we don't stop there forever but but we let it just be what it, what it is in that moment uh you know i just i just mentioned that example because uh the the whole psalter is there for us because we are we are whole people and uh and it's just an incredible resource Amen to that. Um, and, and I bet a lot of us like the reminder that Psalm 88 uh, doesn't move to that place of hope, but that it is good for us to just be honest, right, about uh, I, I heard I've heard some people say that uh, while they are continually trying to be resilient, the last word they want to hear sometimes is resilient. <laughs> um, it, we've, we've heard it a lot through through the uh, through the pandemic, though it's exactly what we need to be. Um, it, and your comments reminded me too of Dr. Agard's um, temptation, right? Naming the temptation that we we can, as pastors, as leaders, we can be um, tempted to put more into our persona than sort of our honest being. Um, and and you talked about the gift of just being uh, in your presentation. You, you reminded us that uh, that we're made in the image of God. We're not God, um, and you invited us to and gave us permission to create. Um, someone has offered a question here uh, in the, uh, Tommy Grimm has, has said, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the, the create and rest rhythm? What's the significance on focusing on creativity and creating versus work? Um, thanks and and hi Tommy and and hey to everyone out there. So you know I hope you heard in my presentation the the idea of of creating like for its own sake. There's there's a just because dimension here that is really really important. So many people in ministry are um, are either uh, you know achievers or like pleasers like wanting to uh, hit a mark right wanting to show that we're doing the job and um, and there, there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of works righteousness in all of us <laughs> we're gonna do the thing that that we're supposed to do to be holy to be good to be faithful uh, but there's but there's things we got to do just because this is how God made us. And because this is, this is how God is. And, and God has made us in this image. Um, we are, again, we are whole people. And when we just focus on the job um, and, and what, what uh, we have been told is the shape of being faithful uh, and it's a list of things that we do, um, then, then we are neglecting huge portions of ourselves. And this is also why I think it's so important to be creative, even, even in spaces where you lack talent, because it's not about how good is the thing that you make. It's not about hitting a benchmark. It's not about getting attention, getting acclaim. It's, it's about participating in God's creativity. Uh, so, so that's, you know, and I will also say, I, I'm a, uh, some of you know, I'm a quilter and, um, and that's, that's my art. I, I also love dancing and, um, and, and I, I just partly share this out of knowing how for me, it has been so healing, so refreshing. And it's, you know, yes, I can connect it to what I do as a biblical scholar and a theologian, but I don't have to, uh, not in an explicit way. It can just be just because I love it just because it, it's this whole other side of, of me. It's a whole other side of life. And it connects me to so many things that I would forget and neglect otherwise. So um, that's, that's why, that's part of why. Yeah, that's a good word to type A personalities out there. Yeah, uh, of, of which I would say I'm, I'm one. Um, it, Two questions have come through here that I want to make sure we get to before our time ends. We only have about four more minutes. Um, one 
is around creation. And uh, Dr. Williams, I'll, I'll direct this to you. Um, it really is life-giving, refreshing to immerse yourself in creation. How? What are some practical suggestions for how pastors or leaders can can do that? Um, I think because we, you know, are going to have to merge out of that workspace into um, into a natural space. It's okay to consider what it means to work in a natural space, right? Um, so maybe all of us cannot afford right now to go away, turn off the, um, turn off our cell phones, retreat into the wilderness as I could do like right now. Uh, I don't need any prompting. Um, but uh, consider um, reimagining what communion looks like outdoors, what fellowship looks like outdoors what church in our work looks like outdoors, because beginning there, not being confined into, you know, inside um, already invites people to understanding that we are, this is also a part of who we are in worship and as a community. Um, I think that we kind of ever so often kind of point to like, okay, we're going to do a picnic outside, you know, on so-and-so day, three months from now. But what does it look like with us saying one day, you know what, hey, it's first Sunday, we're going to be, you know, we're going to go to this park, or we're going to go, you know, to this body of water, and we're going to be with God in this way. Um, so I think first working, working our ministry into creative spaces and into nature would be one thing. Um, and then when we do that, allowing um, the imagination of our children, we should rely on our children, our youth to help us connect um, in these spaces. So when we now change our location, now we can invite our, our, our children to help us reimagine what it means to, to breathe the air and to touch the water. And, you know, and all this might sound just, just so, I, mean, I don't know what it sounds like to you, but let me tell you how important it is to see that God has already imparted God's self in character in the earth, standing tall like a tree, flowing like wind and water. And we can take those things, those examples, and we can embody those spaces. We can take those spaces in. We can ask God to show God's self when we go out into these parks and these, these natural spaces. So, you know, I don't want to just give this unrealistic, you know, um, this idea that, that we just say, we're gonna just run away and go into the wild. I'm saying, why don't we incorporate nature, what is there already into what we do, into prayer, into communion, into fellowship. And I think beyond that, God would lead us um, to more creative ways to engage. I wonder how many pastors may be um, inviting their church now to, to meet a Sunday morning at, at a park um, after, after your comments. The last question for our time, um, I'm going to push the two together that, that are still uh, yet to be answered. Really, both are around boundaries. Um, how do us practical steps on, on setting boundaries with congregation that wants you to be uh, available all the time? Uh, and I think we could say both in the social media space and in person. Um, Reverend Floor Bixler, could you say a word about boundaries in, in person? And, uh, and then af after a minute or so, I'll give uh, Dr. Agard a time to uh, answer uh, boundaries in the social media space. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, I, I think it, it, as we've even been talking about how much of, how much of our in-person is actually now digital and how blurred those um, those realities really are. Um, I, I think what can be helpful is just communicating to congregations over and over again that what your days off are. Um, and in order to do that, you actually have to have days off. Um, days that are actually set aside that you are um, unavailable. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the, um, one of the, something I've seen that's very practical is to put it in your email tag. Um, I do not check email or social media. I'm not available for calls or in-person visits. Like really spell it out. I'm just not available on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, I'll get back to you on this day. Um, and, and you're suggesting putting it below your signature on right. every email yes, you send. 
Right. Yes. Okay. Every I, email I, you send that people uh, receive, they get a reminder to you of yeah. the boundaries that you've set. Or it can also be, you know, I check email twice a day, once in the morning and once at night, or I'm available for pastoral care on Tuesdays and Thursdays, whatever rhythms that you need to set up to organize your life. Um, email signatures are a great way to communicate those on a consistent basis. The social media space and the physical space really is totally uh, uh, porous in, in a way, isn't it? Dr. Agar, can you um, contribute as well? I was about to say the same thing. These two areas bleed into each other. They're overlapping in so many ways. Um, but I, I agree that, you know, we have to set firm boundaries, but that begins first internally so that we have to attend to our need to be needed. Um, and that is often one of the reasons that we don't negotiate healthy boundaries. And then when we do, we teach people how to treat us. And so if we always respond, the expectation is that that will never change. And so pastors who are trying to create healthier boundaries, part of it begins with a conversation. And when it comes to online, I'll give you a quick, um, sort of a quick example. I have seen many things online from congregants, um, and it's just inappropriate. You know, you can see something that's like, oh, wow, that's probably not a good idea to put out there. And if I see that, I'll pray about it, and I will contact that person personally, one-on-one, -on -one, not to chastise them about what they've posted, but simply to say, I see you're having a hard time. And after the conversation, then I can say, I don't know if you want that still to be out there as your witness, because I know that this is not who you really are. Mm. You might want to consider taking it down. And very often that has happened, but we live in a culture now where sort of a knee jerk, put it out there and that's it. So I think as pastors, we don't have to immediately respond. Uh, we teach people how to treat us. And there are multiple ways to communicate with people, but we have to do it in a way that honors our boundaries and theirs. So, yeah. I, I appreciate all of you, your participation in this, your answers to the questions. I know that there are um, more coming in, but our, our time, uh, unfortunately, has come to a close. Uh, and I wanna make sure we have time to pray for all those who've been um, participating by, by viewing this webinar and to encourage um, more conversation to come out of it. Our next webinar is next month. Uh, everyone who registered for this one and participated will, will receive uh, the video from this, and they'll also receive invitation to sign up for next month's uh, webinar as well. So again, to presenters, thank you very much. Um, I wanna lead us in a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, uh, I ask for your blessing on all those who've participated today. Indeed, there is a, a meshing together. There, the boundaries are porous between being in person and being online. For, Lord, I know you have gathered all of us together today. May the seeds planted in this hour grow to nourish your servants. And may we remember that we are not you. We are only made in your image. And being made by you, let us hear again your opinion of your creation, of us. You called us, you called your world, you called all that you made very good. We give you thanks, O Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you all again for your participation online, for answering questions, for asking the questions. We hope we'll see you again in another Wind in Our Sails webinar next month. God bless.